Psoas. All right, so I'm going to pull him down here for a second. Psoas muscle. Um, have you noticed? I've created a diaphragm oh, very cool. out of some press and seal that I had in my pantry. Um, I'm George. And remember, the diaphragm muscle is your primary muscle of breathing, all right? When it pulls down, it helps you to bring air into your thoracic cavity and all that wonderful stuff that we like to call breathing. So the psoas is going to um, originate from, because we're thinking about psoas minor and major together, uh, T1, I'm sorry, T1, that'd be way up, that'd be real high up, uh, T11, <laughs> T12, all right? Uh, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. So it's the bodies, it's the TVPs, which are the, um, the prominences that stick out, the bony prominence that stick out laterally or to the sides, and then the intervertebral discs. And, and then also, the there'll be like a fascial blending up there with the diaphragm. So there's gonna be, all right, your uh, psoas, and then it comes down, and it goes into, get rid of this for a second, and it goes down into the lesser trochanter. All right, so let's just get him back in anatomical position. There's the greater trochanter, and the lesser trochanter, let's pull him around here, it's going to be back here on the inside upper portion of the femur. So it's got to go down, and then bleep, just pull the diaphragm out. See, that's why you don't want a tight psoas. It'll rip your diaphragm, right? Uh, just, <laughs> oh, that is a lot. <laughs> I learned on Two Anatomy Geeks that if your psoas was tight, it will rip your diaphragm. Rip your right your right diaphragm. Out of your body. <laughs> <laughs> your body. Yeah, they're probably no, I saw, I saw it happen. You probably just keep on right. saying stuff like that. So it's going to come down into that lesser trochanter. Now, there are going to be some um, fascial attachments that will be um, down in, like we said, down in the, the pelvic floor down through here. So think about the pelvic floor in this area and through here, you're going to have some of the fascial attachments that would be in that pelvic floor. Um, and Dr. Osai will talk a little bit more about that. And then this is, um, this is your pubic bone right here right there it's part of the hip bone and this little top portion is called the superior ramus of the pubis ramus means branch so this is the top branch of the pubis so there's going to be if you did have let's say you did have um but but as dr Osar will say even even though we most of us don't have the um uh so as minor you still have kind of some remnants of where those fascial attachments would be. So let's pretend, I'm going to stick this here and then bring it down to that superior ramus. So that would be kind of where, you know what they say, don't work with kids, dogs, or electrician's tape. <laughs> I, I, I've not heard that. Yeah, it's true. It's true. All right. So that would be where some of those fascial attachments for um, the uh, psoas would be as well. All right, cool. So what does this muscle do? Well, we said it does uh, flexion of the hip. So again, bringing the insertion closer to the origin does flexion of the hip. And then also it is going to do some abduction, right, of the hip. And then it will do lateral rotation of the hip. So notice when I laterally rotate it, guess where? That insertion is coming closer to the origin up through here. Uh, again, it can it, it it contributes to posterior pelvic tilt and it contributes to lumbar lordosis because if you go from this view, if this so as if we keep the leg fixed or the femur fixed and we pull the origin closer to the insertion, you can picture George's thoracic or sorry lumbar area would start to pull anteriorly kind of down towards that insertion. How do these positions lead to anterior pelvic tilt? Because we hear people say, I learned this too, right? I learned this for years and years. Sitting causes tight hip, tight short hip flexors, causes weak lengthened glutes. But I want, to, want you to look specifically at this gentleman sitting here in the image to the left. What position is he sitting in? As you can see, he's sitting in posterior pelvic tilt with lumbar spine flexion and increased thoracic kyphosis. 
Now, what muscles are technically short and tight in this individual? I'll give you a moment to think about it. Jill, actually type it in, type it in. Which muscles are short and tight? And I'm gonna ask my integrated movement specialist because I know some of you guys are on, thank you for being on. Please don't answer because you already know the answer. So as you're listening to this, please type in which muscles become short and tight in this individual and which muscles become long and over lengthened in this individual that's sitting in this position, which is how most of your clients are sitting. Jill, give me the first correct answer. Uh, glutes and hamstrings. You are absolutely correct. Okay, and I got another one. Um, short, glutes and hamstrings. You are correct as well. <laughs> you can see this client, this individual is sitting in posterior pelvic tilt, which shortens the muscles on the back side of your hip, your glutes, your hip external rotators, and your hamstrings. That's why your clients struggle with bending forward like this guy's doing. He's not getting anterior pelvic rotation, so he must bend more from his low back. So sitting in this position does not cause short, tight psoas. It does not cause short, tight hip flexors. It creates over lengthened hip flexors. We'll talk about that more next time. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Our exercise of choice, supported hip hinge. This is how we set our clients up. We always start with optimal alignment and control of the thoracopelvic cylinder. Hands go up on the wall, step back. We breathe in and then breathe out and hinge. So right here, I'm gonna stop the video. I'm gonna stop it right there. If you notice there, thoracopelvic cylinder aligned, sit bones spread, hip, knee, ankle, and foot in alignment with each other, slight knee bend. My goal is to focus on lengthening, spreading the sit bones, lengthening the posterior hip complex, the glutes, the hamstrings, and those external hip rotators. Because why do we want to eccentrically load? It's like pulling the rubber band. We need to load to unload. If you can't get eccentric loading, you won't get a good concentric contraction. If you don't lengthen well, you don't shorten well. So stop focusing so much on shortening and squeezing. Focus more on your lengthening. I'll play a few more repetitions, but you get the idea. Align, control, lengthen. Spread those sit bones so you're teaching the client how to do a proper hip hinge. So that way, that is what they're going to do when they take, in, take it into their deadlift pattern. We'll do it from this side as well. Align and control the, the head, neck, and thoracopelvic cylinder. Watch the line on my shorts. The line on the shorts should stay level. The sit bones are going wide. The thoracopelvic cylinder stays aligned. If you notice the hands, the thumbs are facing in, lightly pulling the wall apart, hinge across the hips. If your client has shoulder issues, then just take the hands off the wall and do the hip hinge without the wall. The wall is really nice because you also get the lengthening of the lats and that thoracolumbar fascia. So your hip hinge is as a corrective exercise. Your pelvis should be relatively over top the ankles and feet. However, once you load it, you will need to translate the hips posteriorly or the pelvis posteriorly. However, if you notice, I'm still in anterior pelvic rotation, but again, it's rotation of the entire cylinder. It's not just anterior pelvic rotation. So again, as a corrective exercise with, no bot with just body weight, try to keep your pelvis more over top the ankle joints. As a loading, so once you get load in your hands, like a dumbbells or a barbell, you will translate back but you have to keep hinging. If your client is anterior pelvic rotating or rotating the entire cylinder, they're not performing it. It will bother their low back. And that's why so many of your clients, so many of fitness professionals in the industry have low back pain related to deadlifting. The biggest thing I want you to take home from this, this first part is number one, develop your system. We talked about that, the importance of developing your system, honing your system, and really using a systematic approach to working with your clients. The second most important thing, I want you to stop gripping the glutes, stop over-activating the glutes, stop cueing your clients to do that, unless you find yourself in this situation. There is one situation. If you find yourself in this situation, you should grip and grip for all your worth. If you're ever in that position, make sure you grip because yeah, otherwise bad things happen.